Teresa. <laughs> wow, what an addiction. It just has such a hold over me. Because Lisa's, they're just so powerful. And I love a powerful woman. I love a strong woman. I love a woman that I can, I can lean on. Of a woman that I can just like embrace. I want a woman that I can count on, who's like reliable, who says when she'll meet me at Sunday at 2 p.m. She'll be there Sunday at 2 p.m. That's really important to me because most women, they're not reliable like that. But my Lisa's, they're reliable. I really love a reliable woman. I love a reliable car. I love a reliable woman. I love a reliable computer. And I just like things to be reliable. Like, the world out there is just so chaotic. I need order. I need, I need someone that I can count on. And my leases, I feel like they, they like created the new me. And I worship them. Hero Israel. Here is Lisa. She took me out of bondage. That's so much power I give my Lisas. And they have so much power over me, I resent it. I resent how much I need them. How strong they are, and, and like that differential between their strength and my strength. And so I feel like the the way I can get even is by raping them with complete one hundred percent consent. Like you understand, the safe word is Pittsburgh. You say Pittsburgh, I stop. Okay, we're just playing here. This is just pretend. No real fighting, no real kicking, no bruises, no punches. But just tell me no. I just want to hear no, 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 no. Tell me I'm a bad man. Tell me I'm a bad man. I'm a bad man. Tell me I'm a bad man. I want to know I'm bad, I'm wicked. I'm just taking my selfish desires out on you. And then when I'm finished, I feel like I'm even with life. Like all my frustrations and pains, they've, I've forgotten about them. I'm now even. I've even the score. Life and me were quits. Like my leases, they're, they're the recompenses for. All the bitches who screwed me over over the years. But uh, that's the old look. That was before I converted to Orthodox Judaism. And I hardly even recognize that guy anymore. That was before I truly understood the profundity of the Torah and what, what love is supposed to be all about. And at my least as they have money. I've always been poor. At least it's drive nice cars. I drive bombs. My Lisa, she lives in a nice apartment in Beverly Hills. I live in a hovel. Lisa went to Harvard. I dropped out of UCLA. Lisa's wear power suits and high heels and short skirts. I wear jeans and t-shirts. Lisa's are active in charities. Lisa's lead charities. Lisa's give big bucks. I give ten dollars a month to my synagogue. Lisa's are social. They're always going to bar mitzvahs and weddings and christenings. I go to Starbucks and I write out my feelings. Lisa's are connected. I'm disconnected. Lisa's are successful. I'm unsuccessful. My friends call me the great underachiever.
but when I can connect with Lisa, and she's by my side, and I can drill Lisa, and it's like, I've never done cocaine, but I once saw someone do it. They just like, they cleaned like a couple of inches in an otherwise filthy apartment, and then they put down a line because we were about to go out on the town. I just went, and so I've never done cocaine, but that's kind of what I do with my leases. I just, I just inhale them. I just want to absorb them. Like I wouldn't need them so much if every cylinder of my life was firing, but usually only two or three cylinders of my life are firing. Like perhaps my job is going well, and I'm getting a decent night's sleep. And I've got some friends. Okay, the more of those cylinders of my life I can get going, the less dependent I am on my leases. But uh, I don't know why, it just comes down to if I if I I feel like if I can just be a great lover, if I can just give Lisa orgasms, then I have some sort of power. And, and I feel whole, and I feel even with life. So I'll take Viagra. Until she says, get away from me with that thing. So about a year into my relationship with Lisa, in 2010, uh, we were talking on the phone. I, I'm a big talker, big into communication. I'm a very doting, nurturing boyfriend when I'm not in the grip of my eroticized rage. So that's 99% of the time I'm a doting boyfriend. And uh, Lisa said to me, why do you always go for girls who are emotionally unavailable? That was like a, that was like a dagger, like right between the ribs, between these ribs into my heart. Why do I always go for girls who are unavailable? And why do I always go for girls who are depressed? The obvious answer is that uh, my stepmother was depressed when I was growing up and I took care of her and that's how I understand relating to women in these codependent I take care of you and you take care of me kind of relationships. I just feel like I'm caught in some kind of whirlpool. It's just going down and down and down. I've never had a relationship much longer than a year. I've never been married. I don't have any kids. So yeah, I'm a serial monogamist. I've never really been a player except for my first year in LA. Those were some good times. In 1994, I thought there was going to be plenty. But more than a serial monogamous, what I am is a serial enthusiast. I always think that I've found something that will fix me. So, as a child, I think that if I just become a Christian missionary, and go to like dark places and convert the heathen to Christianity. That will fix me. And then at age 11, I take up running marathons and I finish five marathons, 26 miles, 385 yards. And I think that I can run away from my problems. I think that I can, I can win Olympic fame, gold medals, running marathons. But I really showed no promise. My fastest time was way over four hours. It was not, it was not good. So I take up journalism. I think I can, I can be a great journalist. And I do get a lot of fame as a seminal blogger. I was one of the first bloggers to make a living from blogging, which I did from 1997 to 2007. Felt like I was profiled by every major form of media in the world. You know, I was on 60 Minutes and Entertainment Tonight, and I was in the New York Times and the LA Times. And, 
and that made me feel big and strong. I love attention. But then, if Lisa didn't return my phone call, like all my strength just dissipated. I was back to being a needy boy. Like none of my serial enthusiasms are stronger than Lisa not returning my phone call. So if you want the big truth about my life, the big truth of my life is my love life. It's not my yarmulke. It's not my Orthodox Judaism. It's not my practice of Kundalini Yoga. It's not my Alexander Technique teaching. It's my love life. These very predictable, cyclical relationships with nieces. And my therapist asked me, do you think that you're using Kundalini Yoga, Alexander Technique, and Orthodox Judaism to try to push away your underlying depression? Whew, that was hard to hear. But I immediately recognized the truth in what she said, yeah. Yeah. Just trying to push it away. Almost every time I walk into a room, I start thinking, how can I manipulate things so that I can get the maximum of attention? This, this play is a symptom of my illness. I'm not, I'm not relating to people as they are. Often I'm relating to them for what they represent to me. I remember it was just before Christmas, I'm at work, and I go up to this guy at work, this non-Jewish lawyer, and we have this really frank, open relationship. We can, you know, we just volley it back and forth. I mean, everything goes. So I just walk up to him, in December and say, hey, my rabbis told me I can't say, shouldn't say Merry Christmas because that's granting legitimacy to Christian claims for, for Jesus. The guy got all offended. He got all offended. I mean, what kind of whip is that? He like marched off. And for the next couple of weeks, he just marched up and down my floor at work, like complaining about what a bigot I am and what a racist I am. And then the Jews... Then the Jews came to me and told me that I am causing anti-Semitism. Because I just said the simple truth. I cannot authentically as a Jew say Merry Christmas because that is authentic, authenticating that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. And that's just not authentic to who I am. So I go into therapy and I sit down and I talk about this. And as I talked there, I realized I was feeling some hostility when I said that to the goy. And it wasn't really directed at this goy. It was really directed at my father, the ultimate goy. My father is a Seventh-day Adventist preacher, Seventh-day Adventist evangelist, Seventh-day Adventist Bible scholar. He chaired the religion department at Avondale College in Australia, where I grew up. And uh, I guess the hostility that I was venting at the Goy, and that I continually vent at authority, is really directed at my father. I've never played nicely with others. I've always preferred solitary pursuits like blogging, or where I can just kind of work and do my own thing. Because there's just so much rage there against my dad. And I know the following statement is true, even though it makes no sense to me. I mean, I just consciously can't get in touch with the following statement, but I still know it's true, but uh, all this lashing out, I do all this rebelling, this play, so I want to get my father's attention. I think there's something to that. I mean, and I cannot connect to that. I cannot connect to that. Because I cannot connect to that. I, I don't want anything from my dad. I don't want anything from my mother. They both did the best they could. So 
and my dad's 84. And I'm thinking, what will I feel when I see my father's coffin being lowered into the ground? And I think that what I will feel is relief. Maybe like relief and release from all the rage. Maybe it will just go away. I don't know. I've had two other complicated friendships, close friendships. And when the person died, the primary thing I felt was relief. I hate negotiating relationships and friendships. Like too many complications. So much easier just watching porn. Your life is so messy and human relationships are so complicated. I don't like negotiating. So my therapist says to me, So your real life father is too painful for you to deal with. And you, you think you'll feel relieved when he's dead. I said, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in therapy, and I'm just tearing my nails, which is a habit I thought I'd given up in high school, ninth grade. That was the really the only time in my life when I used to tear my nails, ninth grade. But now I'm doing it again. I'm sitting in therapy, I'm tearing my nails. And I'm talking about my father. And my therapist says, stop, just, I just want you to listen for a while. She said, so your father chose your mother over you. Father chose your stepmother over you. Father chose his work and career and preaching over you. Father chose his religion over you. He farmed you off to other people, other families to take care of when you were young. He chose things that were for his career, but completely against your self-interest. He's ashamed of you and doesn't want you to show up to his <laughs> sermons. How do you feel about that? just the tiniest, tiniest tinglings of anger. She says that's good because if you can feel something, then you can eventually release it. And until you get in touch with this anger that's coming out in all sorts of distorted ways, it's going to twist your life. Now I feel something. Let the healing begin. So let me give you a taste of my father's preaching. I grew up listening to thousands of hours of my dad's sermons. As a little boy, I would stand in the pews and I'd, I'd imitate his gestures. So I'm 46 years old, let me imitate my father once more. Say the, the last world. thing about six years old. When I was six years old, I was there in the pews, imitating my dad's gestures. Now I'm 46 years old. Let me imitate him all over again. Friends, the only people who can move the world are people who the world cannot move. They are people who have joy everlasting because they know the truth of the apostolic gospel. Friends, 
Do you want to be right with God tonight? Do you want assurance of what's going to happen to you after you die? Do you want to be reunited with your loved ones who have passed on? Do you want to be free from the burden of sin? You can't climb your way to heaven up the shaking, burning, fiery side of Mount Sinai. No, 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 my friends. Salvation is a free gift. For God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Will you pray with me tonight? Will you come forward and pray with me? Lord, we are but dust and ashes. We are the greatest of sinners. That you sent your Son, your only begotten Son, to take the burden of our sin. He who knew no sin was put to death for our sins. And Lord, we accept the sacrifice of your Son. Bathe us in the blood of the Son and wash away our sins so that though we are red with sin, we shall be as white as snow. And Lord, I know that I can count on your promises that this day, yes, verily, this day, we will be with you in paradise. Okay, that's my dad. All I have of my mother is this book. My mother Gwen, she died before I turned four. This book is called Fireside Stories. And it's a book of Christian inspirational stories for children. And uh, my mother didn't leave a note or a letter for me. She knew she was dying. So all I've got of her is this book. This little book. And so I, I pour through it, kind of looking for messages for my life. Guess what? It's just completely ordinary Christian proselytizing. There's no great writing in this book. This is all I've got from my mother, and it's just ordinary Christian inspiration for kids. There's nothing here. There's nothing here for me. Nothing. I turn it and turn it, there's nothing. Thanks, Mom. So, years one to four, while my mother is dying of cancer, my dad's very busy looking after her, doing his work as a Christian evangelist, sharing the religion department. Doesn't have time to look after his three kids, so we all get farmed out to various families. Like, I'll stay one place for a few weeks, another place for two months, another place for two weeks. Stay with about 20 different homes during those three years. My mother dies. My dad is now this big catch in Seventh day Adventist church, and the women are like flocking to him. And this one woman, she corners him in the library. She says, There's at a vision that we were to marry. My father says, Well, if that was true, I would have had the vision too, and I haven't. The church insists that my father get married because it's the distraction for him to be chased by this many women. My father knows he needs a wife to look after his three kids. My father knows he needs a secretary to help him with his French and German because he wants to get his second PhD. So my dad marries his secretary. And this is exactly what my birth mother Gwen pushed for. She told him he should marry Jill, his secretary, which he does. So, when I'm about four and a half, I get my mother. I get the woman I regard as my mother. And I cling to her. I cling to her, and I tell her, I'm a lucky boy. Most boys only have one mother. I've had lots, but I don't want any. I'm really 
close with Jill, about two weeks of each month. The other two weeks of the month, she's insane. She's violent, she's angry, she's depressed, she won't get out of bed for days at a time. Totally bewildering to Dad, totally bewildering to me. But uh, when she's sane, I cling to her. When she's insane, I cling to Dad. Dad tells me, well, all women are like this. They have these, these hormones and it drives them crazy. So when, when Jill's sane, she's just so loving. And I love her back. When she's insane, it feels like it's impossible to love her. And so my father and my stepmother never really had a chance. I never see any love between my father and my stepmother. I grow, it, grow up in a home where I don't see any joy that they take in each other's company. They're devoted to transcendent ideals, my father's career, bringing the world to Christ. They're dutiful. They do their best by me. But home is a, is a cold place. It's an unsafe place. When I turn to my mother, I never know if she's going to be sane or insane. She's going to be violent or compassionate. I become five years old. It's like this little kid, and my stepmother is five foot ten. And if she catches me, say, eating a cookie between meals, which is a big sin in the Seventh-day Adventist church, and she, whack! I'm just going to fly across the road, bouncing off the furniture. My older brother and sister leave home as soon as they can. I, I don't have that option. My dad's very busy. And so I know that his work comes first. I've always known that. So I, I don't bother him. But I learned this great thing. I learned if I could just sit there in a chair, I can tell myself fantastic stories where I'm heroic. And I can just feel great. Within a, within a minute, I can just feel great. I am like leading an army into battle. I'm leading a group of explorers into the jungles of South America. I'm leading a flock of ships into battle. And I know that I'm going to be a great leader because I can be so ruthless. I have no feelings. I'm like my father. No feelings. And beside these fantasies, I sense this power which also has the ability to transform me out of my misery. And it, and it comes from down here. And in second grade, I pick up a book on uh, reproduction. It's my mother's book. So I learn about how it's done. And it's just it's amazing. It's like I'm tapping into this power. It's like in second grade, I'm learning there's this current in the universe. I just stick my finger in that socket <laughs> and I just come alive. I'm not miserable anymore. Sex. Girls getting inside. That's, that's where it's at. First joke I ever tell is father, mother, son are in bed together. And the uh, Father tells the son, pull your Tonka toy out of mother so I can park my big truck in there. And then I was launched on my career of telling dirty jokes. Second, third, fourth grade, the girls had no interest in us boys in this way. Those boys had erections. Where do we stick them? What do we do with them at this erection? Father tells me to, to leave it alone. 
Don't, don't spend too much time washing down there. Don't touch it. It's send you crazy. It says women are not watermelon, that you just drill a hole in to see if they're sweet. You can't just use women for sex outside of marriage. So some of the boys in my class, they're already sticking it into each other. Catholics may like it in the rectory, but us Seventh-day Adventist boys, we do it in the dunny, in the outside bathrooms, so many of us have in Australia. I go for a long walk into the country with one boy who's doing this, and I get right up to the edge of sticking it inside of him, and I get scared. No. No. I'm a preacher's kid. I know right from wrong. I know that's wrong. I don't go there. The other boys in my class are doing it with farm animals. I don't go there. Finally, fifth grade girls start to show an interest in me. There's this chubby girl. She really likes me. And so I take tacks and I put them pointy side up on a chair. And I sit back and I watch this chubby girl sit down and yelp with pain. She sits on my tax and they draw blood. I'm kind of frightened by what I've done so that I don't do it again. But when she gets too close, I don't know what to do. So, so I kick her. Kick her. She starts crying and she says to me through her tears, one day you will know what it's like to be kicked by somebody you love. And she cursed me. My parents and I moved to California in 1977. I'm 11 years old. And America is great because there are no uniforms in schools. More importantly, there's no corporal punishment. And my teachers were hitting me all the time in, in Australia, no more in America. Girls weren't wearing makeup in private schools in Australia, but in America they could wear makeup. And in America the girls would wear lip smacker. And they'd just put this shiny gloss on their lips throughout the day. And they would smell of strawberries or vanilla or, I don't know, these exotic tropical smells. And it was fantastic and made me high. And I just wanted to lick the strawberries off their lips. The greatest thing about coming to America is that nobody, nobody knows I'm a loser. Nobody but one person, me. So in those first few weeks of sixth grade, I'm interesting. I'm not relegated to the bottom of the social packing order. What do I mean by social status? Do people want to be with you? If people don't want to be with you, you're isolated. And isolated is another word for dead. Those first few weeks, sixth grade, Cindy Anderson, the most beautiful girl in the class, she walks by my desk one day and drops a note on it. No one has ever dropped a note on my desk before. I open up the note. It says, will you go with me? This is the greatest thing that has ever happened to me in my whole life. The most beautiful girl in the class wants to go with me. I am so flooded with, with joy and excitement. But just as when your car is flooded, it won't start. I was so flooded, I couldn't start either. I didn't know what to do. I wasn't really close enough to anyone to talk about what had happened. My, my scathing words you know, kept people at a distance. Like as far back as I remember, I just feel driven to say, hateful, spiteful, provocative, bigoted things. It's so exhausting to try to keep that under control. So I don't make any reaction that first day. And then the second day, when I see Cindy, I start teasing her. And I see her talking to another boy. I say, Cindy and Mark, all the world loves a lover. Young love, isn't it sweet? I would just publicly tease her. Until she hated me. Don't play with 
play the camera. Oh, God, if I could just have one do-over in my life, if I could just, it would be this, like, why couldn't I say yes to what I wanted the most in the world? I really wanted to connect with a goal. I was so isolated, I was so isolated, so wanting to connect. I just had no model for connection. There was no love in my home. My home was... My mother and father trying to do what was right. But there was no love between them. My father was this flamethrower of the Christian gospel. He would like spray it on like napalm. He'd always keep himself in the center of controversy, which left you know, my family kind of on the edge of things. My father's a PhD in rhetoric. You know, he's excellent at slicing people up. My mother is depressed half the month, and just an endless whirlpool of need just going down and down and down and down. My father's so tense, so anxious, he hates to be touched. And when he does touch you, it's unpleasant because there's so much tension in his body, so much anxiety. I had no models for how to connect to anyone. But if I could just have one do-over, I would say yes to Cindy. Say yes to her and ask her, how do we do this? Because this would be my first girlfriend. How do you do this? How do we create our own Moonrise Kingdom? that have made me seem weak and she would have lost interest. Or perhaps I could slowly, painfully, awkwardly learn to connect with one person and there'd be someone that I can talk to. And I could, I could connect to a reality outside of the warp reality of my home. Like, reality is denied in my home. If I'm out for a walk with my father and I fall and I skin my knee and I twist my ankle and I'm writhing in pain, my dad immediately announces to everyone, he's fine, he's fine, don't worry about it, he's okay. And he's like yanking me up. You know, blood's pouring down my knee. Uh, my ankle is, is sprained. You know, I'm in great pain, but my dad's speaking for me and announcing I'm fine, I'm great, don't worry about him. My father's one of those powerful men who can, please, he can like distort reality just by the power of his will. Somewhere between sixth grade and seventh grade, I slowly start taking very awkward baby steps towards connection with the opposite sex. So I spend my afternoons in the Pacific Union College swimming pool. We're at a Seventh-day Adventist college in the Napa Valley. And there are three of us boys and three girls, and we play keep away games. It was really just an excuse to touch. But I don't have much experience with gentle touch. My experience with touch is getting hit. So when Jeannie, this amiable blonde, and she's not so beautiful that it frightens me, scares me, and intimidates me, like Cindy did. Jeannie's just nice. But when she gets the ball, I just charge at her like a safety in football. I like tackle her. And I dunk her under the water, and then I lift her up, and I'm like ripping her arms away from the ball. And this game is all just so you can put your arms around each other. But I'm hurting her. And the guys pull me aside and say, hey, this is just a game to touch. Just enjoy touching. But 
I don't know how to do that. The end of eighth grade, my father's theological controversies just ignite into what's known as Glacier View. Look it up on Wikipedia. And he convulses the entire Seventh-day Adventist church with one long speech denying its central doctrine that the church is specially chosen by God. My dad says Seventh-day Adventists aren't any more special to God than other evangelical Christians. So my dad's removed from the Seventh-day Adventist church's ministry. And he goes out on his own, bringing us with him to Auburn, California. Sets up his own Evangelical Christian Foundation, which largely ministers to ex of the Adventists, called Good News Unlimited. And he's the focus of much media attention. He's written about it in the LA Times and Newsweek, and, and he tells reporters, we now belong to the invisible church of Jesus Christ. So this mythical church does not have a big youth program. Kind of our, our little gathering now on, on Saturday mornings. And that gets 50 or 60 people. It's just like so isolated compared to what we had. I always grew up in Seventh-day Adventist college campuses. All my friends until this point, the Seventh-day Adventists. That's what's familiar to me. Now we're ripped out of the warm bosom of the Seventh-day Adventist church. So I going to public school for the first time. And this is where I, I developed this lifelong awkwardness with watching people walk towards me, people that, I, that I'm acquainted with. I just start feeling anxiety because I don't exactly know where I am with this person who's kind of walking towards me. Do I, do I keep eye contact as the person keeps walking towards me? Or do I look away and come back intermittently? So if I'm good friends with a person, I don't have this anxiety. Or if the person's a stranger, I don't have this anxiety. But if the person's in between that, and I'm, I think I'm not exactly sure, I don't understand, I just feel anxiety. Super Bowl weekend. 1982. I'm a sophomore in high school. And my family's flying to Brisbane, Australia for my older sister's wedding. And we've been spending a lot of time in the day, of course, because of my dad's theological controversies. He's always flying here and there and often bringing us with him. So I'm at the newsstand because I love to read. And so I read my Sports Illustrated and my time. I notice the men around me are often picking up Playboys in the penthouse. So this weekend, for the first time in my life, I pick up the new Stan Cup Playboy. And I think it's the April issue, 1982. It's got Mariel Hemingway on the cover. In the center fold is Linda Reese Vaughan. She's like five foot tall. She likes to ride horses. And this is the first time that I take my truck, just open up the pages. It was fantastic. I just feel so alive. I just feel so happy. Like I, I want to study Playboy like my dad studies the Bible. I mean, this is heaven for me. For my father, heaven is being with Jesus. For me, heaven is being with a girl who looks like Linda Reese Vaughan. It's just intoxicating. All my, all my troubles go away. I just feel so alive. I feel like I'm connected to that, that current that, that sustains the universe. It's like... <clears throat> and so every chance I get that vacation, I, I hightail it to a newsstand and start picking up all the girly magazines and just like, just inhale it, just inhale it. And, and so even when I'm not looking at the pages, I've got... I've got the picture stored in the hard drive of my mind that I can revisit and make myself feel strong and big. 
summer of 1982, I spend it away from my family at Pacific Union College. I stay with friends, and this is just a huge relief already, just you know, to get away from my father, who always has to be the center of attention, and who's just so strong that it just like warps the reality around me. And away from my mother, who's just racked with this depression two weeks of the month. Now I stay with friends, and I can be a normal kid. And this is where I experience my first love. The girl's name is Rainy. This is the summer between my 10th and 11th year, before my 11th year of high school. So I'm about to become a junior in high school. I'm 16 years old. She's a year younger than me. And she was a year behind me during 6th, 7th, and 8th grade as well, when I was at Pacific Union College Elementary School. But now, now I'm ready for love. Again, she's not so Cindy Jackson, Cindy Anderson beautiful that I can't, that I'm just racked by feelings of loser than like, Rainy's on my level. And I work in the summer camp for kids. Rainy works in custodial. She looks after the gym, keeps it clean. So I see her every day, and we just start talking. And she responds to me. And I just feel absorbed in her. She's round. She's not fat, she's just round. And I'm really skinny. And, and I just feel, and I completed in her. And she responds to me. Maybe it's like what a, a mother and a baby is supposed to have happen, which I didn't really get to have happen. Like when the, when the baby looks at the mother and they kind of learn something in that, that very early bond. Well, I think I got intimations of that with, with Rainy. Like I would look at her and she would look at me and there wasn't anxiety. There was, there was peace and there was joy. And we didn't need to talk about theology. Like, theological controversies were the topic of conversation in my home. <laughs> like, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Rainy didn't care about theological controversies. Rainy could, like, pull faces. She could pull faces underwater. We'd go to the pool and she'd pull chipmunk faces. They were just adorable. And I just adored Rainy. And I was able to keep separate the porny side of me. I just kept like that lustful, little bit cruel, rapacious porny side. I just kept those feelings separate from my, my pure love for Rainy. We didn't talk about what we had. We didn't use the term boyfriend, girlfriend. We just, we just go to the pool two, three afternoons a week. And we rub sudden tan lotion on each other's backs. I've done this before with girls, but never with one girl who I really, 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 really like. So I'm like, I'm taking these baby steps towards normal connection with the opposite sex. I've looked at Playboy. I, 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 now, I, you know, I know what a naked woman looks like. But I, I put that aside with Rainy, and it's a little difficult for me seeing her in a swimsuit because she's just so naked, even though it's a very modest one piece, black one piece. But still there's just so much like vulnerable female flesh right there. And and I've seen the Playboy, so I know what the Playboy playmates look like. And it's a little it's a little scary for me all full of brain right there. Or we're just playing in the pool, just innocently. And this little black boy, he pops up between us. He's got, you know, goggles. And he turns to me and he says, Why is your penis sticking out like a lance? It's the most embarrassing thing that ever happened to me. Like I took that little kid and I dumped him underwater and like Rainy had let out a yelp and she was like swimming away. And after I dunked the kid, I like swam after her. And Rainy got out of the pool. And I got out of the pool because I wanted to show her that I wasn't stalking her through the pool with a loaded gun in my pants. 
and oh, like we had this pristine, pure thing going, and then this little boy had to spoil it. We never discussed what happened, but it, oh, I wanted to keep my my love for Rainy pure. One day in August, my mother comes up, drives up to Pacific Union College. I go see Rainy. You know, say these awkward last words. Like I always seem much more emotional about things than Rainy. She's much more easygoing, and I, I kind of grab her and kiss her on the cheek. I never kissed her on the lips. And I'll say, "I'll write to you." And we, and we drive back to our home in Auburn. And it's like a hundred degrees out, but it's like winter in my soul, and I'm back in in the emotionally cold home, and, and I'm writing letters to Rainy every day, getting letters back. And whenever I can, I get back to Pacific Union College for, for a little weekend for the Sabbath. And one time when I see her at church, she says she's going to a Journey concert that night with a college guy. That just, that really shakes me up. I don't, I'm, I'm behind the times. I don't have my driver's license. I've never been to a rock music concert. I don't like the idea of her going out with another guy. I don't feel strong enough to be able to tell her any of this, so I just cut her out. I go home and I stop writing to her. That's, that's the only way I know how to deal with my anxiety. And after a few months, she writes me and says how hurt she is and, and I don't reply because this makes me feel strong. I go to this great party, the Invisible Church of Jesus Christ. So it's one good party. December 31, 1982. It's a Saturday night. I'm a junior in high school now. And this girl comes to the party. She's a freshman. I've never seen her before. And She's blonde, and she responds to me, like, I can't talk a good game. Like, I don't know, one out of 100 girls finds me mesmerizing. And she found me mesmerizing. We went up into this loft with a chubby friend who I knew from high school and from church, and we were talking up there in the loft, and then I lean over and kiss her. And I'm preparing to like send my tongue down her throat. She like stops me. She slows me down. And she teaches me how to kiss. She, like glides her lips over mine, and, like concentrates on the top lip and then the bottom lip. And she nibbles. And then her tongue goes a little bit exploring under my lips. And then we just go full at it, our tongues just like writhing like snakes. And then we pull back and just kind of look at each other and giggle and laugh. And this glide, 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 nibble, 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 suck, suck, suck. There's just so many things you can do with your lips. And it was, it was the greatest high. It was like, it's like heaven. It's just, oh. everything I needed to learn about kissing, I learned that night. I never kissed Rainy. Now I am skilled. Now I am, I'm on my way to adulthood. I know my way around kissing a girl now. I mean, this is awesome. A lot of firsts in my junior year. One day I, I buy this pornographic novel at this bookstore and I take it home. As I'm reading it, I just start kind of pushing on myself, pushing on myself. And I feel this glorious tension and excitement kind of building through my whole body. And then there are these uncontrollable spasms, and suddenly like this gray, sticky stuff comes shooting out of my penis. And it goes all over the couch, all over my legs. And I'm, I'm absolutely frightened, appalled, swear I will never do this again. This is the 
first time that I've, I've masturbated to, to an orgasm. This is my first conscious orgasm. I've had wet dreams, but this is my first, my waking hours orgasm. And it was, after I got over the fright and the mess and cleaned it all up, it was great. So I, now I know how to relate to a girl. I know how to kiss a girl. I know what a girl looks like naked. I know how to masturbate and, and just imagine that I'm having sex. Like, I am right. I'm right on the edge of like getting inside of a woman, like that, that current that, that drives the universe, that, that solution that I've, to my misery, that I kind of read about in second grade, and that, that power that I felt kind of welling up inside of me, this, 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 uh, and that selfish, passionate, predatory, driving, desiring to conquer, I am ready to conquer. I visit liquor stores, look through the Playboy and the Penthouse magazines, often on my walk home from high school. When I see the clerks don't care, I start gathering up magazines and buying them. And I develop a collection that I keep in the woods outside my home, and I find this old mailbox you know, on this deserted street. And so I shove all my magazines in there and I cover them up with leaves and I go visit them after school on my way home. And I don't just look at the pictures, I read the articles. This is like, there's this world of, of beauty and passion just out there. And these magazines are like the breadcrumbs that are leading me to the bliss that, that awaits when I become an adult. I'm, uh, I'm scared of real girls, very, very tentative with real girls. But I know that there's this sexual cornucopia out there. Somewhere before 12th grade, I go back to Pacific Union College and I keep running into Rainey, who I completely cut off contact with. And one day I'm walking her home, and we're walking through the woods, and we cross over a stream, across a log. As we get over the stream, I stop her. I kind of put my hands on her arms. And I tilt my head, and I look at her. She doesn't freak out. She doesn't freak to me, and I lean over and I kiss her. So this is kissing someone who I love. This is this is a different experience than just the purely athletic event it was for me with the blonde freshman girl. And and I feel like I'm connected to the very center of life. I'm like living from the inside. And as I finish kissing her the first time and we pull back to catch our breaths. And he says to me, we could have been doing this last summer. I didn't tell him I was too scared, too frightened, didn't know how. You have 10 minutes. But uh, now, now we're, we're into it. And we're going for regular walks, and we're making out in the woods, and walk a bit, make out a bit. One day I get it back to my place. And I get her onto my bed, and I start trying to rip off her clothes, and she says, I'm not that kind of girl. And I felt like she owed it to me, because she'd gone to concerts with that college guy. And I just cut her off again. Just cut her off completely. UCLA. I'm 22, and I transfer. And I finally lose my virginity. Only with one, that one girl. It was fantastic. It shakes me up. 
just all the emotions that, that come with being in this intimate relationship. I'm, I'm trying to change my life again. I'm, now I'm converting to Judaism. I, I, I won't have premarital sex, but then I slip. And there's just such a difference for me between being with only one woman and then once I'm with my second, I'm like off to the races because there's just so much variety and just so much adventure and so much terrain that I'm now off and I'm just like from woman to woman to woman. I'm sleeping with every woman I can. And I'm in Los Angeles and I'm following those breadcrumbs to bliss all the way to the San Fernando Valley. I start writing about the pornography industry and, and I'm, I'm famous and I'm making my living as a writer and my family's appalled. They're so worried, they're so ashamed and so they give me this deal, they'll fly me back to Australia to consult with the doctors of their choice because I think I'm really messed up. And I see the psychiatrist for three hours and she comes back with the diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder. That I basically only relate to people for the mirroring, for the feedback that they can give me about who I am. I'm that needy for attention. She recommends that I need at least 10 years of psychotherapy. And I recognize the truth in her words. So I get myself to a therapist. And as I'm talking about what I want, as I'm talking about my sexual desires, my therapist says, that sounds like a roticized rage. I've never heard that term before, but as soon as I hear it, I know it's true. It's the anger underneath sexuality. It's the desire to break the rules. You get the charge out of breaking the rules. That's what makes sex exciting. And for me, sex becomes exciting when I can pretend, get my girlfriend to play, you know, my eighth grade teacher or my therapist, or we can pretend to play rape, you know, something really, really bad. If she'll tell me that I'm a bad, bad man, that's where I get my charge. So I rush home. I, I Google eroticized rage. I learned it's a symptom of sex addiction, that even if you control your eroticized rage so that you only express it in socially acceptable ways, it's still this poison that contaminates and gets in the way of ordinary interaction with people. Because when I've been going through an ordinary day, I'll see an attractive woman, and then I'll develop a scenario, and I'll be thinking about that during the day. And then when I get home at night, you know, I'll masturbate to it. And that is way too often just the absolute highlight of my life. So when I realize this, I get myself to a 12-step program. Completely cease masturbation. I find it brings such great clarity. Because I can't use these wicked scenarios anymore. So it transforms the way I relate to people. I'm able to relate to women as human beings now. Not just as cogs in my sexual fantasies. And as I open up my 12-step book and I'm walking the steps, step four, it says one sentence which changes the way I look at my life more than any other sentence I've ever read. It says, we addicts have used everyone and everything in our lives to meet our addictive needs. I know that's true. I know that's true. It shakes me up to, to working the program hard, to writing out my list of resentments why I resent people, what have they done to me, what role did I play, and then putting out of my mind the harm that they've done me. I concentrate on things that I've done that have separated me from other people. I start making amends to people that I've been a bastard to. I learn to attribute other people's bad behavior towards me it's their own spiritual sickness. And just as I want understanding the nasty things that I do, have done and still continue to do at times, so too I need to under, extend understanding and help the people who have wounded me. In almost all of my resentments, I was able to let go, except for my resentment towards my father, which is kind of outside my conscious ken, because I have you know, no rational reason to resent him. He did the best he could. So, the people like my father, I have to pray for them every day that they will get things that I want for my life. Connection with the good people around me. Peace of mind. So, as I've been working my program, 
find myself asking two main questions each day. How free do I want to be from my emotional addictions? How real do I want God to be in my life? Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so the last two things are really major. So I deal with them. That feels like um, the impact of the change that you're going through. And also, if, well, I take that back. If you're going to deal with God, then you got to set that up way earlier. It can't, because otherwise, then it's like a bomb um, that we never get to see or understand, and it dangles there. You know, the only thing we heard was just a little speech about your father, and we don't know why you became an Orthodox Jew. So, um, there's some really good stories here, lots of good stuff. You need to have a framework, and you need to really decide what are the breadcrumb stories. So, what is the path? Is it about um, the high of sex? And love, the addiction, the compulsion? Is it about the rage? Is it about the abandonment of the father? I mean, I know the rage and the abandonment are connected. Um, what, what do you see the problem of your character being? What do you want it to be? Rage. Crippling. Rage that separates them from other people. Okay, so that's then what we're going to trace, how that happens. So that means, and also the stories about the parents are wonderful way early, because you kind of started with the apex of his problem, and then we didn't know who he was till about 40 minutes later. That's when we started hearing about the childhood and where he comes from. So it's fine to start with the bang and start at the end or start at the climactic moment, but I wanted you then to give all the context and the setup of who this guy is, where he comes from, what his mother looked like. And also, I don't know if you realized, there was such hostility and rage towards the mother. This is this is this book is useless to me. So I wondered if he's connected to that and that it's also, you know, the rage is in reaction to the loss. He doesn't know what to do with that. I'd also love to see how he and his second mother were loving to each other. Love to see a moment, see a scene of that, and then likewise see a scene of the insanity. Um, did your father also not like to touch? He did not like to touch. So I want to see that. I want to see that played out. I wanted to get more um, intimate moments with the father and the son because touch and rage are connected, um, you know, all the violent things that he did. And then, and I wanted to understand this, when he's able to actually take in touch, when he doesn't have to do something violent, so was it that first suntan lotion moment? I mean, go into the sensory, the sensuality, and why he wasn't frightened, why he didn't have to do something. What allowed that? What was that change? And then what then brought um, the rage back? There's a lot of, I don't know whether, um, you know, the father denouncing what he believed in, if that's part of this. You, 
you tell me whether that is or isn't part of the rage? Because again, we can't get the whole light. Because father denouncing what he believes in. You know, the father is. speaking out and him being kicked out, and then having forming the invisible right. church. So right. whether that is or every story that now has to be connected to the rage. If not, it's out. Also, one thing I noticed. So again, it's a moot point if it's not connected, but the invisible church, I thought that's just like the boy felt invisible. Mm. He felt invisible, mm -hmm. invisible. Mm -hmm. You know, so he's kind of like the invisible mm -hmm. church mm -hmm. in a sense. Mm -hmm. And also, all the biblical references, I don't know if you are making that parallel of, you know, the, you know, God and Jesus, um, the sins of the Father, and if you felt like you were the brunt of that all the biblical stories, that's a parallel when you were talking about sin and you having to take that on. Um, yeah, so I guess that could, could you, be related sorry, to the you rage. So you talked about, um, you started talking about biblical stories. And, um, Okay, um, that's what it is. I can't find it, but it's here. But I just wondered if you completely identify with, you know, the things that the Father is quoting in the Bible about um, God and his son and you. And also, um, the highs that you get. There were about 40 minutes worth of kind of coming of age, sexual coming of age. So you might want to condense that. Um, this game is to touch the boys tell me this is just the game um, you're hurting her so that was a great story um, also I wondered if the narrator compartmentalizes he took his anger out on the little boy so I wonder was that because he was ashamed of his body he actually blamed the little boy so is it is there an embarrassment? Oh, and that you know it was this has ruined everything. So was it she's pure, she's nice, so to not have anything sexual, and the sexuality is just with the Playboy girl fantasies. Yeah. And then I wonder if it's you know is that because of the father setting up this is bad, this is wrong, and yet the father tells him at a really young age. Um, they're not watermelon. Don't use them, and then that's exactly what he does. So I don't know if, if it was he was re if it was because he was rebelling against his father, or just that thing of the abandonment and the loss, and that whenever love comes in, he kind of has to zap it. You didn't really go in at all into the 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 porn and the blogging stuff, so. That really is directly connected to the rage, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Did I speak for seven minutes? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yes, you did. And I bet you can speak for some anymore. And it just goes like that. Um, so I will send you all this. We need to work on the beginning to really set up. And what is the connection to that song, to the rage? Or is there any connection? The What's wrong? Song, song? Oh, I don't know. It came to me today. I don't know. So, see if you want to investigate. So there's something in your subconscious that is telling you about what that is. Is it being in control? What does that song mean to you? Or is there a time in your life that that song represents? It's like 
kind of leaving this wall because I'm about to bring you into a rape scene. The, you, the audience. So I'm like, and we're leaving this world. Now it's time to leave. So I didn't get to... that that okay. was for that. And also, um, I didn't understand at all the rape scene because I couldn't tell if it was what it was or if it was telling her to tell me no. It was confusing. And to consider if that is part of the climactic moment, I wasn't sure. You kind of did it mise-en-scene about... Um, mise-en-scene is a film term where we actually... the camera doesn't see it. It's happened off-screen, but we know it's happened. So I want to know the darkest moment of his soul, when everything comes crashing. Because I didn't know where it was. And to also consider taking the opportunity of what was it, first of all, to be diagnosed. Was it scary? Was it a relief? Was it a combination? Was it, oh my God, I've always thought something was wrong with me. Here it is. That means other people. You know, I just, I've got to hear his take on it. Because that's a heavy duty thing. Also, I might have missed, because I was writing so much, what did he tell the family? What didn't he tell them? And what was it that made them send him back? What was it that he told them? The family, my family? Yeah. What was the SOS that, oh, you better come back. We're going to take you to a doctor. Oh, in 2000, yeah. yeah. What, what, what was the incident? It was my infamy from writing about the porn industry. So I wanted, so, yeah, we that got all lost. That wasn't set up. Why is he writing about it? What was the infamy? Did somebody else tell them? How did that happen? Um, and did you figure out eventually they're going to know when you were just waiting for the bomb to drop? Or did you hope they're so far away, they're, not, they're, they're never going to read No, I didn't this. terribly care. So I want to know that. But again, okay. is that part of the rebellion? Given it to your father or not, I don't know. And what brought him into the porn? Um, is there, was that part of his obsession, addiction with sex and the high of it? Or was it more about getting back at his father, going into that, or a combination of both? Um, So, I don't know, should I just read you all the notes? Uh, or I want to work on the beginning, the setup. I mean, I, I can email you this. Yeah, you can email me the notes. And I also never got, when everything was happening, what the woman's reaction is. I don't know what the woman, what's a woman's boundary with the role playing. How does she respond? How does she react? Did you figure out what boundaries are? How, you know, we have no idea about what the rape thing and how a woman responds to that. Um, are all women Lisa's? You know, what is this archetype of Lisa? How does a Lisa like you and why? Um, what is the way that you woo? Lisa. Um, how do you connect? And what's the difference? Because you said, oh, I want them by my side and then I want to drill them. Two different things. And so by my side, it almost could be like a caveman, you know, yanking the woman by her hair, codependent. Um, and so is the opposite of rage connection? Yeah. Or is it the absence of rage allows you to connect? So the because I know, or I'm guessing, the rage is masking the fear. So you don't have to get hurt, don't have to be vulnerable, because you're lashing out. So it's impossible to connect, right? Yeah, it's intensity rather than connection. And so what we'll play makes a lot of intense him, role so, so connection really 
his intimacy, and we understand because of his background why that's so scary, and I guess set that up. So then what makes him want to connect? Why is that viable? Why isn't that um, too scary? What makes him think, oh, I do want this? Is it that there were moments in his young life or with some of the girls of his youth? I just need to understand that about why it isn't like, you know, a vampire cross. Well, it's just it's just a huge hunger so, for me to connect. So that's what I think you really need to set up. These two extremes of so wanting to connect. What is that emptiness? What is that hole? The loneliness. And and to go into the loneliness of a little boy. And then, you know, the the Jekyll and Hyde thing that takes over. And there was a moment, I think, with Rainy where you said, oh, I'm able to control my porn desires. And so I want to see what he does. And I also wondered, is it because he's satisfied, he's fulfilled, he feels love, so that goes away? No, it was more two tracks. There's the pure track. Yeah, with rainy and you know, so again, higher, so is it love. just that oh, when sex and then there's the sewer, up. there's the, his sewer instincts. But is so it he that to keep them he separated. has to separate sex from love? She's pure. Yeah. Well, at least his his nasty sexual impulses versus his elevated loving impulses. Wants, but can love and to, sex coexist? Yeah, him? but not that he's. He has this driven towards nasty. But cool that's what sex. I mean. So, is there any healthy sexual? Yeah, there is, but because we didn't hear about it. Yeah, we yeah. didn't hear. All yeah. we heard was pure, mm -hmm. innocent, pure mm -hmm. snow. So mm -hmm. it's almost like we either have Snow White or the Playboy Bunny. Mm -hmm. Nothing in between. Mm -hmm. And then is that because of his religious indoctrination, you know, or whatever the schism is? So I also want you to think about who you're talking to. Can't just talk. Is it the audience is your friend, your confidant, um, the therapist? Who are you talking to? Why are you saying this? And also, what do you want and need from the audience? Do you want to have connection? Do you want to be off pitting? Do you want to shock them? That will determine what you say and how you say it. Who are you talking to? I think I'm meant to be friends who will come. So huh? I'm, talk I'm talking to my friends. I'm meant to be my so, you, but aside from that, you got to make the whole audience. As a player, you have to make a decision. Okay, the audience is my friend or my confidant irregardless of whether you actually do know people in the audience or not. Because that determines how you're going to say stuff and what you would say. Okay, so assuming that the audience is my friend, uh, I think So do you understand what... I think that... We that have to be... You have to justify, as the playwright, why you're saying this and then who you're talking to. If I made the audience my mother, I would say very different things right. than if I'm, um, oh, please, audience, I, you know, I want you to be my friend, or I'm confiding these things that I feel really horrible about, and I hope it's okay. Uh, it's not, it's definitely neither of those. But that's what I'm saying, I'm just yeah. I'm giving you two yeah. examples. Okay. That, that, because we have, and you have to know and decide, and it can't just be, I hope I know some people in the audience, you as the writer. But the audience is uh, like my friend Joey, someone who's okay. interested in this topic. You know, was very open to what I have to say, and I can't. Okay. I can't offend. I can't offend Joey. It's nothing I could say that could offend Joey. Okay, That's my audience. and then how? Okay, so and what do you want from the audience? What do you want and need from the audience? Who do you know? Uh, I want those in the audience or like 
Joey understands everything I'm talking about. Right? So you have to factor in everyone isn't going to be Joey. Right, but you said you wanted me to personify my audience. So yes, but, so what do you want from the audience? What do you want from Joey then? I want him to have a deeper understanding of himself. Of himself? Yeah. How so? Well, Joey has all, almost all the things that I do. So, so I can is it that it. you're talking to other addicts? Yeah. Or who is Joey? Yeah, either other addicts or people who are sympathetic to understanding that. Understanding what? Emotional addiction. Okay, because we never even heard that word or that term. No, but that's what it's all about, even though I didn't use the term. Well, so is that what it's about, or is it about rage? Um, eroticized rage is a form of emotional addiction. Okay, so... Eroticized rage is a subset. Of, it's a small part of emotional addiction. But... But what? Anyone with... Anyone with emotional addictions, which I would say is at least half the population, should be able to identify with what I'm struggling with, and help, I can help articulate you know, many so things. So you've got to set that up. There. You have to be really clear about that, to not assume. So there may be people that you are inviting, but that will be a given. But there's going to be half the audience that may or may not. A lot of people in different kinds of 12-step programs, but I think set that up, that that's what you're talking about, that's what you're addressing. And to think of then, what do you really need to say if you want somebody in the audience to understand themselves better? So that also means reaching out. I thought like if the, if the deepest and most clear I can get about myself, then that gives me the greatest likelihood of uh, connecting with anyone else. Um, say that again. The deepest, the deepest I can go to myself, like yes. what's underneath that, what's underneath that, what's underneath that, what's underneath that, right. you know, frustrated inability to connect. But then what? what it, and what does it mean and do to you to be able to say it out loud? Is there shame? Is there embarrassment? Is there guilt? Is there relief? The release. Um, there's a little shame, a little guilt. Because I want to hear that. Because I feel like there's still there's a disconnect with what you're saying and then how it feels to you. So that little piece is missing. And I don't know if that's part of the emotional addiction disconnect, yeah, or even then to talk about effect. it. Yeah. But I want to hear you addressing it, and to know, is this easy for you to talk about? Is this hard? You're pushing yourself? Do you care what we think? Um, you know, there's going to be a completely different reaction for women hearing this. Well, my primary goal is to say the choice. Yes. Thing I can say. Right, no right, right. How but then I want to know then how that affects you and impacts you. Because uh, otherwise, I mm -hmm. get. Um, yeah, immense candor. And then I can't tell if it's bravery or this is part of. Um, the addiction in what he's saying, or because it yeah because it still feels like there's a disconnect between what he's actually saying and how he's relating it, being witnessed in this moment. Well, I'm an addict trying to talk to you with as much clarity as I can about the deepest things that are bothering me, but I'm an addict. Right, 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 right. Trust what I have to right. Say. But I guess, yeah, I just wanted to get more about where you are with I'm a serial what is this like to talk about it, to say it out loud, to admit it to yourself. Um, it's it's not that hard. It was at various times, but I've I've uh, 
have so trodden over this territory, you know, tell everyone I'm a sex addict. So I'd like to then know also that motivation. What is it to want to tell people? And then what it, well, when were the hard times about it? And then are you released by talking about it? Um, a little bit. I'm a little bit. I'm isolated as well. It's so I want to hear all that. I want to hear also the vulnerability about talking about this. And um, it's like the cross I've chosen. Mm, so that's a great thing to bring up and weave in. It's like almost no matter what the consequences are, I'm going to talk about this. Okay. And then how it, it isolates me. And then is me. that a parallel to the father? Yeah. Is this your version yeah. of your invisible church? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though actually, mm -hmm. luckily, there's a big church mm -hmm. that you're in. Right. So, do you want to work on the beginning? Yeah. Okay, so we have um, about 15, 25 minutes left. Okay. So, should I... <clears throat> Oh, and also, um, that moment when you talked about sitting, do it. And I didn't know if you were doing it in front of your father. I could sit, and then I would just fantasize, you know, all your Walter mini things. Actually do it and take us through it and set the scene. I didn't know if you were sitting in your room or sitting, and this is a way to be with your father and then occupy yourself because you were invisible to him. So if you want to take a moment and really think about what you're setting up and who you are. So maybe do maybe we can go into like the first ten or fifteen minutes. Unless I need to stop or something. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And also, you're a blank slate. Always see it as a man that's wearing a yarmulke. I'm sorry, what do you mean? That's what we know. We have some physical right, signals right, of who right, he is. Okay. And, and so that's what we're going to be noticing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who is he? Mm -hmm. Why is he telling us this? And, mm -hmm. and is he going to deal with what we see? Mm -hmm. I am Luke. I'm an addict. I'm an addict to girls named Lisa. What's the truth? There's an archetype, a strong, powerful woman that I'm driven towards. What's the addiction? Uh, they feel, they make me feel I feel like they can rescue me okay. and pull me out of the muck of my life. Okay. And I attribute to them all sorts of magical qualities. They're going to just transform my and life. Do, and does it, do they need to be Jewish? That helps. Helps if they're Jewish. But it's not a... It's not, it's not a prerequisite. Okay. Okay. I just love, I love powerful people, period. I try to attach myself to powerful people, period. Okay. And I try to have sex with Lisa's. Okay. So then that's also then a natural transition into your father. But I, I want to try to struggle with the rape scene. If I can make that work. I'm addicted to Lisa's. And, and uh, yeah, and you could do that. And yeah, that's a good thing. And we can talk about whether it makes sense to do it at the beginning or to use that as um, the climactic moment. Because that's where everything has gotten so bad that something has to give, otherwise he's not going to make it. Like, I feel like Lisa's can rescue me. They can just like pull me out of the muck that my life has become. And what is the what is the muck that you're like? Disconnected. I'm disconnected. I'm isolated. I've been kicked out of five of 
best oh, right. in our synagogues in P.K. Robinson. Because why? Because of my grubby writing, just because of my your grubby, grubby writing. self. What do you mean your grubby writing? My grubby writing on the pornography industry. And my grubby self is like, who wants that dirty insect on my nice white sweater? That's so what, what makes I feel you write? Like. For, nobody forced you. It's the only way I know how to make a living writing. It's the only topic that I can make a living writing. Well, why do you think that is? Well, because everyone's fascinated by pornography. Not everyone, but there's a huge audience. So okay. I get 10,000 visitors to my website. That will make me a living. 10,000 people a day are not going to come to my reporting on Judaism. I'm lucky to get 3,000. Okay. It doesn't pay as well. Right. Okay. So this is the only way I can make a living. But I know that there, there are ways for me to make an honorable living, not writing about pornography. And the Lisa can show me how. How? How could she? How is she an oracle? She's just, she's powerful. What she's she's powerful? disciplined. What do you mean she's powerful? She she went to Harvard. So she she can makes get a great a living. Job? She will. I just need to attach to her, and then things will open up. Like she has a great bunch of contacts. So you'll get good networking. I'll network, and I'll get advice. And I'll get inspiration. Like when you've got a beautiful woman that you're connected with, you feel 10 feet tall. You don't feel like a dwarf loser. It, it just fills you with a confidence that you can go out and do things that you can't do when you're not connected to a beautiful woman. Okay. But then I resent how much power she has. And Why do you resent it? Because that's what you're saying. Well, you think it's going to rescue you. I, I think it's going to rescue me, but... There's just a dynamic here. All the powerful thesis that I date, they all want to be dominated in the bedroom. They want to be treated like wenches. And in the so bedroom. doesn't that kind of work out for you? Yeah, it totally works out for so me. Because I want to dominate the hell out of them. So where's the problem? There is no problem. It's fantastic. But you said you resent their power. Yeah. I, I, uh, I, re I resent how vulnerable I am, how much how much I pursue them, and then they don't return my phone calls. So they sense the neediness? They sense the neediness. That you actually want something from them. Yeah, they sense the neediness, and then they start, at first, they get a high out of rescuing. It's like, so what it's you, a good codependent yeah, relationship. Yeah, it's a good codependent relationship okay. at the beginning. They get a high out of rescuing. Yeah. They're powerful women who want to be dominated in the bedroom. I want to dominate them in the bedroom. It, it's, it's fantastic. It's electric. They love to play role-playing games because they're, they're emotional addicts too. They're, they're more comfortable with intensity rather than intimacy. So this works for, for both of us. So I say, tell me I'm a bad man. Tell me I'm an evil man. Tell me I'm a wicked man. Tell me no. Tell me no, no, no. Remember the safe words, Pittsburgh. I always say Pittsburgh, I'll complain yourself, but tell me no. Hey, you got to set that up, too, because we, I don't know if Pittsburgh's a code word. you got to show us how you're doing that, because otherwise it sounds like shorthand. Well, it's a code word. It's a safe word. But safe show word. us, set it up of actually telling her that, showing us. I, I am. Like, I, I want to make sure that she is 100% consenting every second of the way. But I want us to play out a non-consensual... Right, but I mean, just make it really clear that, okay, so I'm going to do this, but if it's not okay with you, say Pittsburgh. Yeah. And then why Pittsburgh? Because they beat the Cowboys twice in the 1970s. It's like this deep pain. My favorite football team is the Dallas Cowboys. That's and so the Cowboys beat the Steelers, the Pittsburgh Steelers beat Dallas twice in two very close, painful... Super Bowls in the 1970s, it just like causes me such great pain to this day. So just say Pittsburgh, I'm going to stop. See, you missed that. There's a lot of context there. It causes me pain. Like, so know, that's really significant. Yeah, I feel masculine. Because I thought it was just some random thing. Okay, okay. yeah. Okay. okay. Let's play. Let's play. Remember the safe word is Pittsburgh. That word. But you gotta tell. Yeah, you gotta tell us why. That okay. word. Steelers. Pittsburgh Steelers beat my favorite football team.
in two very close, hard-fought, painful Super Bowls in the 1970s. So I hear the this word Pittsburgh. This is something that you tell the audience. I hear the word Pittsburgh, and I just shut down. I'm just emasculated because, oh, that, those memories are just so raw. 21-17, 35-31. Oh, oh. So just say Pittsburgh, and I will stop. And I went, tell me I'm a bad man. And you tell me I'm an evil man. You need to tell me that I'm hurting you. Tell me no. I want you to tell me no. Tell me to stop. Tell me I'm too big. I'm hurting you. And then, then I feel even with life. You feel even? Yeah. Like all the rotten deals that I've gotten from my, my mother dying of cancer. And, and we can't tell if it's just that you told her that or you just had sex. So you got to fill in the dots. How do I speak to her and how do I speak to the audience? You can just tell us what just happened. I know, but how do I... Okay, you're the audience. I want to be speaking to Lisa directly. Yeah, so it's just a really subtle thing where... Because um, we want to always get as much of your face. You can just slightly turn your body. Yeah, there okay. we go. We know okay. it's not us. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Just, yeah, I just grab my hips. I like my whip a little. I got five foot two spinners. Can you see the drop? But don't up. do it all the way over there. We're missing your face. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let's just lift her up. The legs wrap around my back. And I'm so strong and powerful. I'm just like, I'm the king of the world. Yeah. Good my releases. And then I'm quits with life. I am even with well, life. Well, I don't know what happened. Well, how much do I have to play? I mean, you could just say we had sex or, yeah. or whatever. But otherwise, you know, we're just okay. listening to you and we have no okay. idea. We don't have the film in our head. Yeah. yeah. And when I'm done having sex. I mean, even with life. Like, all my pains, all my frustrations, they're, we're, we're quits. And like, everything that less. life has done to me, it's okay. For how long? I'm fine. I could be fine for... Days. I can float on this for days. I'm good for two days. I'm and just a what? nice person. Two days. Then what? Okay. Then I want you to be my therapist. Be my therapist. I'm going to break the rules. Then what? Then what happens, Dan? Then you break the rules. She could be disbarred for the minute. Dirty, naughty, disgusting things we did. She could lose her license. <laughs> and I'm in her life again. I'm good. I'm calm. I'm at peace. Then, I want you to be a married woman. So we don't need to go through a whole bunch of... Right. Okay. We just want the story to move on. Okay. Okay. I meant, now what happens to you? I'm good. I'm just the nicest, happiest, easygoing guy in the world. Because I'm with my leases. My leases have money. I have poverty. My leases have nice apartments. I have a hovel. My leases have fast cars. I have a bomb. My leases went to Harvard and graduated. I went to UCLA and dropped out. My leases are active in charities. They're socially esteemed. They're connected. They're busy. They're so busy, busy, busy. Where does the problem come in? And you said, I'm addicted to leases. I love my leases because they, they have the magic to pull me out of the muck that I've created for my life. But they don't return my phone calls. So that's a non sequitur because we've just seen you having sex with them. But then we, we become disconnected. Okay. There's not so much sex anymore. I wait longer and longer for them to return my phone calls. And then when we do speak, I get questions like this. 2010, a year into my relationship with Lisa, she says, Why do you go for girls who are emotionally unavailable? 
It's like a knife in my ribs. Wait, that's my heart. Into my ribs, into my heart. Why do I go for goals when I should be unavailable? I guess we all seek the, the screwed up what passes for love that we got in childhood and keep trying to re, reconnect to that. I, I'm stuck chasing women who are like my father. They're busy. They're emotionally unavailable. They're totally contemptuous of me. They're, they're hard-driving, successful, high-achieving, righteous, driven. Is. Just like my father, the Seventh-day Adventist preacher man. The evangelist, the Bible scholar, the chair of the religion department at Avondale College in Australia, where I grew up. Seventh-day Adventism's most famous ex-Adventist. You should look at his Wikipedia entry. It just goes on and on and on. Mine is small and squalid, and his is long and glowing. So it almost becomes a phallic thing. Okay. I don't see people as they are. I see them, what they represent to me, about my father. I seek out women who will hurt me in the deepest way, who will abandon me, who are too busy for me, just like my father. So this might be the place to start then talking about your history, your childhood, okay. your mother, okay. and your father. Okay. Yeah. Okay. How did that feel? Not good. Um, we've got about uh, 12 minutes left, so do you want to go on? Do you want to work on the climax? Do you want to work on the ending? Or I just sent you my notes. I don't know if you want to look over the notes and give me questions. No, let's just... Um So my ending is my ending. Let's talk about it. So let's go back. Um, it's getting the, the diagnosis of eroticized rage. So the, what's the climactic moment? What's the moment where everything is the worst and the darkest moment of his soul? Where everything crashes for him? I guess it's getting that diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder. So what's that moment? What's the gripping moment? So then I realize how really screwed up I am. So what does that do and mean to you? It means that I'm in the grip of... But of physically, emotionally, spiritually, when it hits you, what happens to you? Okay, uh, it's it's discouraging. It's 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 frightening. What's frightening about it? That I realize it that I can't. The way I'm going is just going to lead me to further loneliness, despair, and dislocation. If you don't change, what's going to happen? I'm going to I'm going to die alone. And what do you picture? What's that worst case, frightening? Image? I'll have to move back home with my parents. Because. Because I'm so screwed up my life. This is the only home that will take me. Okay. That's, that's the darkest. Okay. That's, that's and, my greatest And then fear. what is home to you? What is that image of having Of, of my home? There's my, my pained father behind his, his, his pile of books. And what do you mean pained father? He's in pain. He's He's, How does that register to you? Just like the tension and anxiety. How do you see it? How do you physically face, see the, it? Describe the, the, it. The tight, the tight jaw, the, the tense shoulders, okay. the, the, the furrowed brow. Okay. Okay. So is it that little boy having to sit and being invisible, witnessing his father? Well, I, I, yeah, I just don't want to face the, okay. the pain. And, and then what face. moment, when you get the diagnosis, how long until you start feeling like this? 
very quickly. I mean, is it in the doctor's office? Is it on the drive home? Is it when you're having Oh, it's when I get the diagnosis, my sister gives it to me. So, so it's so while she's reading. telling you? No, she emails it to me. Where are you? In Australia. Where? Um, at, around the kitchen table. Alone? I think she gave me a printout of it. Are you alone or with her? I'm with with people. So so to set that up, the environment where you are, and then do you go off in your head, or do you go into your room when all that stuff starts hitting you? So you're actually at home. Yeah, I'm at, at my sister's okay. home, and uh, oh, okay. first Fine. thing I want to do is to put it online, because I realize this is gold. That's the next step. I want to hear about the frightened and the worst case scenario. That's you then kicking into problem solving. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's also you disconnecting from it. Mm -hmm, yeah. So yeah. that's the climactic moment of you really emotionally feeling it and then mm -hmm. going into the most frightening scenario if nothing changes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because that, so that's the climactic moment, and then what does that make him do? Go back to therapy. After the diagnosis. Yeah. Because why? That's the solution to my problem. I need at least 10 years of therapy. But is therapy. it that, okay, there is help? Yeah, there is help. Believe that if I do this. There's a way this, out. Yeah, there's a way out. And then is that scary? Because when we're forced to change, that's very confrontational. It wasn't that scary. It was just, it was kind of discouraging and how much work I had to do. Okay, so I want to hear that. Because, because the like climax is quick. that moment then of the transformation or the epiphany of the character. Okay. And so then take me into that first moment. It's like porn it's is this quick way out. This is like the opposite of porn. Right. It's just a long, slow Right, slide. <laughs> right. Great, great, great. But take me into that moment. Mm -hmm. Let me see that first moment. You know, how mm -hmm. did you even find a therapist? Did you have any shame or embarrassment? Because some men... Yeah, no, no shame or embarrassment. Right. I already had a therapist that I'd been to for over a year. And, and, and so how is this different? So this meant... I thought I was a lot further on than I was. Okay, so did you so go to a therapist? No, I just went back to my, my old therapist. It's like, oh, what was wow. the gap? How long had you not been in therapy? I had not been in therapy for nine months. Oh, so it wasn't even that long. Yeah. And so what was that first moment? Of, first of, moment of? Of now being in therapy for this. Well, then it was like, wow, I've got a lot of work to do. It's like, was it because of what she said? What the psychiatrist said? No, what your therapist said, or was it just the... No, it was the psychiatrist. Saying 10 years. 10 years. And then did you believe that, or did you think, oh, I'm a hard worker? No, I thought, I, I believed it. And so... Because I realized the way I do things, you know, when I try to do it on my own, it doesn't work, so... And what have you done on your own? I've done everything on my own. Like, I've run marathons, I've, uh, I've taken out weightlifting, I've, like, read thousands of books. Okay, so. good, so that's a good litany. Yeah. Again... Why this moment is different now, and then hearing, well, right. you know, this is the way, the way I used to yeah, do the it. The way I always tried to solve my problems, you know, I read a book on it. Okay, okay. And so you can decide then whether it's going to be going to therapy that's different or the actually entering into a 12 step program, and then what that first moment is. Like the 12 step program is just like an extension of the therapy for me. It was it wasn't that but what was it like to be in a room of other people like you, since you always felt isolated and like a loner? Yeah, it was... So that seemed significant to Yeah, me. yeah. It was a recognition that I needed to be here for a long time, just like with the therapy. Okay, okay. It's and a recognition then, of a lot of work. Ahead. Um, what... So what do you want to leave us with? What does he understand? What has changed and shifted now since the diagnosis? Well, every day I, I confront, like, how free do I want to be from my emotional issues? And what does that mean? And what do you do with that? Or do I want my, my behavior, my choices uh, decided outside of my conscious awareness so that I'm compulsively 
uh, doing things that so are not the in my self interest. So that I constantly interjecting sex inappropriately into conversations where it's warping my ability to. So day to day, what are the day to day changes then? So, do I want to go through life where I am unthinkingly sabotaging my relationships but with other people? Let me see concrete day to day behavior choices. How? Do, what changes? Not concepts. What's different in your day-to-day -day life? Well, instead of living with resentment that this person just cut me off in traffic and getting really angry and cursing, realizing that that person needs as much understanding as I want for myself, that when people cut me off at work, women? when women cut me off... <laughs> no, when women cut me off in real life, not on the road, okay. but in real life, when they, they ignore me, put me down, or do things that stoke that have long stoked my rage, realize that, that these women need as much understanding as I want for myself, for my own uh, nasty choices. But, okay. uh, you know, when a woman so, doesn't return my phone calls, you know, I can't blame her for not possessing the magical qualities that I okay. imputed to and her. And so is there peace now? So there's progress towards a little more peace. How is he different? Or how is his life different? There's a little more peace, a little more serenity, a little less compulsion, a little more freedom. And how does freedom, how does that play out? How does he know he's more free? He hasn't looked at porn in three years. He hasn't masturbated in nine months. And so is that um, strength of will? Um, how, how does he place that? What meaning does he well, do it's, that? It's freedom from compulsions. So the things that have dominated my life aren't dominating my life anymore. Okay, so that's what I want to know. And just to make it as concrete as possible so we really see his transformation. And then what do you want to leave us with? What do you want us to know or understand? How real do you want God to be in your life? But again, I don't know what that means. Right, but for someone who believes in God, they will. But what I'm saying is, that has to be way set up for this to be a payoff, and how that is connected, um, I guess, to your recovery. How is it connected to your recovery? Well, if, if God is real in your life, then, then, then your your own habitual ways of doing things out the, out the boss. God's the boss. If God's not the boss, I'm the boss. Okay. When I'm the boss, I fuck it up. Okay. It's, just, it's, just a, it's just a whirlpool just going down and down and down and down. When I start being the boss, okay, God's the boss. So then do you want there I, to be um, a religious overtone? No, I just wanted it at the end. This is a, this is a but see, if it's not set up, then it just dangles. If you haven't already set it up, then it's like new information, and then the show's over. So it leaves us confused. Maybe I want that. Um, it's just going to dangle. Because we haven't heard anything about you really talking about your beliefs. I mean, I know it's kind of central to 12 step, but the whole show isn't about 12 step. No. And it, I know it's probably in the 12 step in alignment with that first thing about how free you want to be. But it feels a little also um, pedantic, unless, again, you've really made it organic into your story about that, you you know, and maybe the place then to put it in or to tie it up is how, oh, you know, I used to do this and this and this and this. When I do it, it's screwed up. So what I've learned is that. But just doing it as a blanket statement um, feels inconclusive.
So again, you know, a whole, a play, a story is these puzzle pieces that are completely all, you know, a good, tight story. They're all interlocked. So one thing naturally leads to the next, to the next, so everything's connected. Because we don't want to just have something dangling at the end. Because that also leaves us not completely fulfilled. Because we don't have the context. Isn't there a school of storytelling where some things are not clearly resolved? Well, that's different. Not clearly resolved is different than just making a statement at the end. That's dangling. Absolutely, things do not have to be in a in a neat, um, tight bow. It doesn't have to be a happy ending. Um, we have the existentialist waiting for Godot, Godot, you know, and that was also their political statement. Godot is never happening. We're waiting forever. The bomb just dropped. You know, blah blah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you know, that is all again what they're setting up structurally. So does, does that make it clear? I'll have to struggle with this. Okay. Because you just don't want to introduce some new statement or point of fact um, without really dealing with it. Because that then leads me to ask more questions when you say that. That's good. That's what I want. But I, you know, at the end, I want to understand where you want to leave us with, and where you are. That's where I think I want to leave you with, and where I am asking that question. But you've never talked about God through the whole thing, so I'd want you to to deal with it, so that then I can understand why you're leaving me with this now. I talked about God and my doing my father. But not what you think and what you believe. And that how are no, you navigating yeah. and how are you navigating through mm -hmm. since that was so, so heavy handed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How are you then able to have your God mm -hmm. and not have it be the Father? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, because I you know, I recognize that it's probably um, a phrase from Twelve yeah, but then it sounds a little jingoistic, too, that you're just kind of tacking it on. Yeah, it feels a little tacked on, kind of an easy mm -hmm. button. Mm -hmm. Well, so I just went when I you. heard that question, I only heard that question once in all the 12-step lectures that I've heard. Yeah. And it just like, wow, I never thought about God in those terms. Like, mm -hmm. How real do I want God to be in my life? Mm -hmm. I just heard that in one lecture once, one right. sentence. Like, whoa. Well, and so it? I just, whoa, how real do I want God to be in my life? Okay. It really provoked me. And then made you do what? I keep asking, how real do I want God to be in my life? And many days I don't want God to be that real at all. Because? Because then I can't do what I want. So then it's conflict. It's complex, yeah. See, so I wouldn't get any of that when you just saying how real. I made a completely different assumption. Okay, my understanding was that here's a person who's you know running on self-will. You know, all his life he's doing what he wants, and you know, kind of fuck everyone else, just doing what he wants. Yeah. He's the boss. He's going to pursue every every interest, whether it's pornography, Judaism, mm -hmm. r running marathons, right. he's just going to go out and do, do what he wants. And now suddenly he's waking up to the idea, like, of, what, of God. You know, even though he's been around God all his life, and he's right. been really religious all his life, right. suddenly he's just starting to open up to and there's something God's real in a way that he's never, he's, okay. he's wondering about dealing with God being real rather than just familiar. Okay. You know, when you, you hear something over and over again, it loses all meaning. So is that connected to the rage?
Well, in the sense that <clears throat> as long as I'm thinking about myself, I'm going to be you know, in danger of being trapped in my rage. Okay, so I would connect those dots. Mm -hmm. And then I get so much more mm -hmm. also, and understand it so much more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then it's justified. And also, I, you know, there were just so many missing, really wonderful moments mm -hmm. that I'm not going to get if you mm -hmm. just make that blanket phrase. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean anything then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Cool.